Um, this year chaired by Renata Tejera and myself, Jörg Ott. Renata couldn't make it to this meeting, which was, um, which is unfortunate, but we'll, we'll deal with this. You don't need too many people standing up here in any way. Um, since this is just our second iteration, I want to have a brief recap on why, where this came from. Though. So the entire workshop has been coming out of a um, one IRSG dinner event where we talked about how to connect IETF and IRTF and research people better so that those communities have a chance to mingle somewhat more. And so we put together this uh, workshop being outlined as a forum for researchers, vendors and so on to discuss emerging results in, in applied networking research. So the idea is to find a place and a, and a framework that allows scientific, people from the academic community to actually submit their work um, to a place that's close enough, that, that follows peer review guidelines and so on, but is close enough to an IETF to make it interesting to maybe stay over and take part in the remainder of the week. And we are particularly interested in applied results that would that could help us um, influence, add to, or otherwise interact with the IETF work and also with possibly upcoming research group uh, activities and the IRTF. So that's just the, the, the rough framework we are trying to run this um, on the Saturday before the IETFs. The, the, the first two occurrences have been the summer IETF. There's no need that this would need to be the summer IETF. This is something that we can uh, surely discuss um, later this afternoon, and I'm more than happy to take suggestions on this, me or other mem members of the steering committee. So for this year's edition, we got uh, 20 submissions, which is a bit lower than we expected. Um, we had each submission reviewed by three PC members. We had a uh, conference call to discuss. And um, in the end, we decided to accept full papers, uh, seven full papers, two short ones, no, three short ones, sorry, and one demo. And um, last year, we had um, a relatively crowded program, which so we decided to go this year to bit towards the other extreme, so we have plenty of time for discussion. We have lots of people from the IETF community here who are anyway eager to discuss pretty much everything all the time. <laughs> so this should give us a good frame, so, so feel encouraged. We'll tell you when we run badly over. All papers are available. Um, open access on the workshop site and in the ACM Digital Library. And again, as for today's format and the stuff that we had, um, we're happy to take feedback in the evening. We have a program committee of a crowd of people who have been putting in cycles to do the reviews, discuss with each other so that we could finally come up with a conclusion of our uh, program. That's those folks, the ones whom you might be Thanks to all of them for reviewing. The people you might want to talk to um, about suggestions for the workshop, uh, future places, volunteering to chair it, and so on, are, are those on the steering committee, which is Lars Eggert, Matt Ford, Alison Mankin, Colin Perkins, and myself. Um, an important element of our little workshop, since we get coffee breaks and we even are going to have a reception in the evening, is that we get sponsors. <laughs> Um, Akamai and Comcast have been providing uh, substantial support, as have the ISOC and also SICOM. From them, we have received funding uh, for allowing to put out some travel grants. So we had handed out a few travel grants. Several students applied. Um, one student, unfortunately, could not make it in the end due to um, bad circumstances in last minute. Um, so but we have a few travel grant recipients. So thanks to all our sponsors as well. Um, and then for our agenda, so this is a relatively relaxed one. So we have a few minutes left for the opening. And we have uh, three technical sessions, one on measurements, one on transport that also features a demo paper. This demo paper thing is going to be an experiment. The paper didn't quite fit as a full academic paper, but we figured it would make up a nice demos. But since this was the only demo that we would have had, putting it somewhere in the corner and hoping that somebody might notice didn't seem to be a good idea. So we'll do it. We'll try to do a full screen live demo for, for all of you and see how this goes. Um, then we'll have some lunch. Lunch will be catered in one of the adjacent rooms here, so we don't have to walk around very far. 
Um, next uh, session is then going to be implementation and operations in the afternoon and then we are going to close with a panel on internet health metrics. This came out of a submission that Leslie Daigle put in um, where we said this is this is an interesting paper but it, but it would actually be much more suited um, for a discussion round and for a panel and so we invited her uh, to put together a panel and she found three happy panel members for us um, and we are looking forward to this as a close of the day. We'll do a quick wrap up and then move to our reception. So last year this is probably hard to beat that FU Berlin put together a barbecue somewhere outside. I don't know whether it rains because I couldn't attend it. But um, so we had to do something more close by and there was no accompanying IETF event. So we just go upstairs to our Cloud9 uh, sky bar and lounge from the Hilton where we are going to have some little bites um, and some beers and related things. So that's, um, we have this place starting at 1700 that opens officially for the public at 1800 and we can stay there and have our stuff till 1900. So this gives us ample time and this would be the time when we are eager to collect feedback in a relaxed atmosphere on what you like, what you, what you have in terms of suggestions and so forth. All right, um, so we have full papers and short paper talks. Um, we are not going to do super exact timing, but we are going to, our chairs are going to watch the time somewhat. So we have uh, um, for the full papers, 20 minutes for presentations, 10 for questions for the short papers, 12 minutes plus eight for discussion. Um, interrupt the speaker at any time when there's clarification questions, but keep fundamental discussions about questioning the methodology that was used and so on to the end. Um, and since as I said before, we do got time, so be interactive. One little requirement is we are being live streamed and recorded by Miteco. So there's the camera, um, speakers should stay somewhere in this range. You can walk around, don't stumble across this monitor and break something, especially on yourself. Um, and use microphones if you've got questions. We've got a white mic here. We have this thing for maybe the session chair and we have um, one mic for the speaker. We'll see if we also get a clip mic. So far there is none, but maybe we are going to get one to be, to be able to organize one. Um, the IETF um, has a note well statement. So we are being recorded and live streamed. So um, think about which political inc incorrect remarks you want to make. It might stick with you. Um, other than that, um, other than that, <clears throat> the IRTF IPR disclosure rules don't apply um, for contributions made to this workshop because this isn't this is outside the regular IETF. It's just an associated event, so you don't have to state anything about patents you might know about about a topic you are going to discuss. Um, yes, Aaron. Looks like that, on the screen is not on. Is there somebody who is able to, is there any questions or anything coming off the Meet Echo? Is there a way that echoes or anything? Um, so that screen is attached to a laptop that looks like it's running Meet Echo, so it might just be the best Meet Echo screen. Um, when, when you just turn it on, which we did earlier, it didn't show anything. Okay, then, 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 then we'll do it this way. <clears throat> You, you can take a quick look at this and just so we didn't have anything any any feedback from Meek Echo last year when we were streaming this so therefore but we can play with this Brian do you want to give it a try it's okay so in the meantime, anybody who has never attended an ITF meeting before, since I see most of the phase two, wow, this is good. Hooray. This is Next question, how many will, of you will be staying for at least beyond the reception and the food for, to, for tomorrow for at least one more day during this week? Oh, just, just of the people who are. <laughs> so one, two, three. Hooray! Four. Okay, so we, we have a few people who are... It requires a time machine to go to ITF 96. Yeah. 
Oh shit. <laughs> this would be a great research. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I would have caught all the type or all the all the updates on the slide. Okay. Um, fi final final questions. How many are, who, how many of you do qualify as students? Also a fair, also a fair bunch. All right. All right. So there's um, there's no queue. Okay. There's no meet queue for this. So then we just if there then. Are questions, then somebody to watch okay. So please, Matt is doing this. All right. Thank you. Okay. Then we have a plan. We have a plan. Okay. This gets us to our first session, um, chaired by Miria. I'm staying up here for a second because I have the first presenter slides on my laptop. So good morning, everybody. Um, so first session, we have uh, two short papers and one long paper all around measurements. Um, and the first paper is actually joint work with some people in my group. And so I actually thought that our student might be coming, but nobody <laughs> managed to convince him, I guess. So the first presenter will be Randy Bush. Um, he's talking about uh, some measurements they did on the RIPE Atlas platform. And I think this is follow-up work on an IMC paper you had like last year, right? Um, I guess if you don't know Randy Bush yet, <laughs> you should take the opportunity to get to know him at this <laughs> workshop. <laughs> um, and other than that, it's all yours. If, if you know me, you know this is not my presentation. <laughs> my presentations have a mauve background and magenta type. Comic Sans. <laughs> this is a per present. This was research. The heavy lifter was Thomas Holterbach, who spent time with us uh, doing research at IIJ, moved to ETH Zurich, et cetera, et cetera. So for the moment, I'm a member of the Zurich Mafia. But back to the agenda. For 20 points, what was missing on that agenda? <laughs> Formal methods. We are standing on quicksand. This presentation's measurement, when serious computer scientists are studying the internet as a behavioral phenomenon, you're in trouble. Enough for a political statement. So this work <laughs> is a measurement one, as an example. RIPE has 9,800 probes out there, which how many people here use RIPE Atlas? Yep. <laughs> if we'd asked two years ago, it would have been none. Um, 9,800 probes out there. Which ones should I use? It's a hard choice. It's like being in an American supermarket and there are 5,000 brands of cereal. They're all the same and the box has more nutrition than the contents. Okay? <laughs> so, the number of probes you, I can use for a particular measurement is limited. Okay, Be they limit it because the platform doesn't want you to get too greedy and you really want to process data from 9,800 probes. Okay, it's hard to know which ones will satisfy a measurement unless you specify and that's difficult. So finding a minimal set of vantage point that maximizes the chance of seeing what you want to see is a fun game. So, they have categorical, categorical properties like this one is behind a gnat, where is it located, AS, et cetera, et cetera. Two probes in the same AS can see very different paths. ASs, despite the religion, are not homogenous. Okay? Two probes in different ASs can see similar paths. The same story, geographic locations, and the other things. So let's propose an advantage points selection method based on topologic similarity. Select the most dissimilar vantage points if I want to see from as many places as possible. Select similar ones if I want to concentrate on an observation and make sure it's not just a problem with the probe, etc. Okay, so how to find similarity, 
how topologically similar is RIPE Atlas overall, and how to exploit this. Okay, how do we measure it? We define a similarity metrics based on the Jacquard index of the set of IP addresses that the probes observe when they trace route to the same destination. Okay, so Jacquard intersects is Jacquard inter index is known as intersection over union. It's I've got a set of trace routes. I have trace routes to the same destination from two probes. There's the list of the addresses they pass through. If they pass through the same addresses, the intersection and the union are the same. So intersection over union is one. If they are entirely different, intersection over union is zero. If they're similar, you get something in between. So if it's equal to one, the probes see the same IP path, zero, they see different IP paths. Okay, for each pair, we compute the Jacquard index for all the destinations they have in common. So this is something you run every month or 10 over the whole set of probes. And they do pairwise comparisons and of the only those that have destinations in common, then, and by the way, when we do this, when I say we run it, we don't actually run new measurements. There's tons and tons of collected trace route data. Some people are using the Atlas probes to scan the entire internet. We just exploit their data, okay? So for each pair, we look at the 25th and the 75th and the median, et cetera, and report the results in a figure. So this is the ECDF of the probes. This is the Shokard similarity. This is percentile ranges. You'll notice, I think there's even a slide for this, that about 10% probes are identical. Right, Shokard index of one. <laughs> Pretty cool slope. So you can get half at about 0.4. So what we have is an, a method that we can measure dissimilarity, okay? And let's check that against some reality. We expect two topologically similar probes to be in the same AS and geographically close. So here are probes with the Jacquard index of greater than 0.9. IPv4, the geographic distance, remember, probes, when you set them up, ask you where it is, you put that in there, so you can tell there are anomalies. <laughs> <laughs> right, but not that many. And in fact, um, um, we've suggested studying some of that, and that'd be fun. Um, so when they're in different ASs with a Jacquard index of 0.9, you can see the index is high, they're in different ASs, but they're still geographically pretty close. Okay? So, topologically similar probes tend to be in the same AS. I know we're all shocked. And they tend to be geographically close. So, we can take topologically sim similar probes to think of them as a super probe. Okay, we're exploiting similarity. So if one probes down, you can run on another similar one. And if your measurement's gonna load a probe too heavily, or you're worried about some other piggy researchers loading that probe up, you can throw it over multiple probes and <clears throat> compare the data. Otherwise, if I want to get a diverse measurement, I get topologically dissimilar probes, and if you compare this, what it discovers in topology versus the right random, supposedly random selection methodology, you get significant, you get 25% better discovery. And that's my song. Thank you. 
Questions? Uh, we have questions. We have time for questions. A lot of time. Thomas, and, I have, and I have prepared, prepared some mean questions for Thomas, but now that he's not here. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, so uh, one question I have is like you, you make we a have somebody from oh. the audience who wins. No, not really. <laughs> I can go first. Is the session chair is supposed to have the backup questions? I have many <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, so you make the statement in the paper that this is better than geolocation, um, and then you figure out that actually a lot of um, nodes that have the same similarity are close by. So. Do you, do you manage to make any assessment if it's really better or not? Is ge you're asking, is geolocation better or worse than Jacquard index similarity? Yes. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did, did, you, did you try well, to even other compare than, that? Just a second, let me turn this back on. Other than taking a look at this, the answer to your question is no, okay. we did not dive further. Okay, that would be interesting to know, actually. Right. To yes. be honest, this was the tale, as you noticed, yeah. noted in the beginning, of another project. Yes. <laughs> and like looking at this slide, um, so is it that all probes in the second set are actually probes that have been probably moved to the same AS and just not been up updated? Or or did you didn't look further into that as no, well? No, they, they did not move the same AS. You know what AS is okay. They're in be by the addressing in the trace route. Ah, okay, right. So they just look very similar. Right. Okay. Right. They now we have a key. But, but, but for instance, um, when you look at, when, when RIPE themselves look at the probes, many are residential. Many, many are sitting behind ho home NATs, et cetera. So in many... I don't want to say geographies, but many places in the world, um, there'll be smaller local providers with their own AS. They all have the same upstream. Yeah, makes sense. So they look like they're different ASs here, mm -hmm. but maybe the next top they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be would probably interesting to look further into that. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's more yeah. research yeah. to be done here. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But I don't think we're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, somebody else in the room. Yeah, somebody else will do it. Here, go. Then I'll take this for now. Okay, we'll work on the other mic. So, um, I'm curious how often, what is a good interval to recompute these indices? I mean, Routes do change, and so the, the underlying properties that you observe by comparing the trace route sets um, do change. And so, did you look at maybe what what happens if you look at every every day, every month, every week? And is would would there be a sweet spot where you say, okay, this would be a reasonable in interval to recompute those things? If you want to spend a grad student on this, go for it. <laughs> it's exploiting existing data, so you're not creating new measurements, so you're not doing. You know, you're not disrupt being disruptive to the net, so it would be easy and fun to just compute it now, compute it on data for six months old, compute it on data for a year old, and look in the change in the data. Easy to do. I think I have something for my, to, to tell to my postdoc on that. Cool, thanks. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I have uh, two small questions. Uh, so how do you account for the unknowns, the stars, on the trace route path? regarding the set of the IP addresses, and also when multiple IP addresses, so as a router responds on the same interface with multiple virtual uh, IP just, address, for example. We're, we're not doing anti-aliasing or any of that stuff. We're just okay. looking at stupid IP addresses. OK, so the unknowns are cleaned up, or they're not uh, they're not. They're ignored. OK. Yeah. Having stars in both routes does not cause a match. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, and I apologize if I simply haven't had enough coffee yet, but um, I wanted, yeah, well, there will be a slight break later on. Um, so I'd like to understand a bit better what your definition of good is. I mean, implicitly I understand or implicitly I take away that the aim here is to um, 
use the minimum number of Atlas probes to best represent the full span of the internet for some general sense of the internet. Okay. Um, we didn't... Um, so, if you don't know the size of these sets that I say up here, et cetera, et cetera, we did not... There's some fun stuff to be done, and yes, we have ignored it. In um, and and there's good base work, good theory that we could apply to say to to look at measurement minimalization. We right. Fess up to not having done that. Um, but ripe, if I ask it, please run this from a bunch of probes. Throws a bunch of probes at me. If I take the same number of probes. I can get a 25% improvement by being picky. Right. So I'm I guess what I'm diversity. what I'm driving at is um, I, the Ripe Atlas platform is useful for any number of different types of measurements and different models of universe. And I think you've got a particular model this of universe. This is trace route. Yeah. You've got a particular model of universe in terms of what you think is good. By contrast, the work that I was using Ripe Atlas for that I'm not going to talk about today, um, I actually wanted to get to distinguish between individual networks. So I wanted to use it to uh, measure in individual networks. And therefore, I wanted things that were more similar to be clustered together. So I'm just sort of driving at the point that um, this, is, this is good and right for a particular model of the universe. Other models apply. Oh, for sure. Like, this is a trace route view. It's not even a geo view. It's not even an AS view, et cetera. This is, hey, I'm looking at topology and with trace route, it's the, this, that little corner of the universe. Hi, Marcelo Bagnolo. Uh, thank you for doing this. I think this is very useful. Um, as, as an Atlas user, do you think, I mean, are you planning to make this available for other people to use? Like when we are going to select probes? It's up on the net. Sorry? It's up on the net. But are, are you keep on planning to keep oh, updating and... providing it as a service? Yes. No, we hadn't thought of that. I mean, maybe since Emil is involved or something, you could... Because it, it's very useful when you want to select probes. I mean, having Robert, this information seems... Robert, where are you? There you are, Robert. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> You want me to say yes? Yes. 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 <laughs> no, it's um, th these are these are typically the thing that that we love um, seeing. I mean, sorry, speaking for the Atlas operations team or, or development team or whatever that. Um, these are the things that we ourselves were thinking about. Some of them, but we didn't do because it's a lot of work and we are not research. Well, most of our, us are not researchers, so you know, there's good stuff to be done here. But once there is kind of some kind of consensus that. This is a good algorithm. If, if only if Atlas ran it inside and gave us the di data naturally, um, that would be great. Then sure, we can do those things. So um, we even have a contributor. I'm taking <laughs> off my research hat. I'm putting on my operator hat since you seem to like to uh, think operators are your major customer, and I am one. Um, is as an operator, when I want to look at how the internet sees my data, sees my AS, sees my whatever, I want diversity. And having this as diversity, I want. So it's not just the researchers who would like this. Um, so As I said, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to pick it up and you know, make this a part of the service. That's no, no problem. <laughs> the, the issue that I have, not in particular with this, is that there are like dozens of these kind of things that people want to throw at the Atlas team to say, do this, do this, do this, do this, building, 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 building. And we have to like look at which ones are, I don't know, more useful or more interesting or whatever they are. As you're at the mic right now, can you tell something about the selection algorithm you're using right now? Sure. Um, that's basically what you can say is that give me probes from this country, they say as this prefix, this and that. But if you say, give me 50 from this AS, then the system basically does two things. Randomizes somewhat, so it just says, well, I'm going to look at these 50 probes for you. 
Um, but the one th more interesting thing that most of the people um, just ignore or glance over um, when they do such a thing is um, that we also have to take into account how busy those probes are. So it's nice that you see a probe in Antarctica and, I, oh, I want to measure from Antarctica, but everyone else wants to do that mm -hmm. as well. So um, we actually almost physically had one in Antarctica, but one of the reasons why we didn't do that is that it would be just useless for everyone. And it's it would be a nice gimmick, ocean, but yeah. basically no one could use it because yeah. everyone would want to use it. Um, so, so I remember a couple of days ago there was a um, hackathon where some of the participants made a much better algorithm of visually distributing the probe on the globe. So they compared, look, when Atlas picks, this is what you get. When my algorithm picks, all over the place. That was nice, except that in reality, you cannot get those. So we need to expand the network to <laughs> make that available to everyone. But coming back to this thing, sure, um, we can do this. We can build in such a thing and say, use the Randy algorithm to give me probes. It's, it's it's don't say it ain't me. It, this <laughs> me. That would be more than magenta. Thomas Holterbach. You're so humble. <laughs> um, but I do have a question, though, um, since I'm standing here. So how would this scale if we had 100,000 probes, a million probes? You know, pairwise comparison is n squared. That's kind of difficult. You're a long way to go. <laughs> This runs pretty quick. <laughs> okay. And it's um, decomposable if you want to use parallelism. I have a last question. Of course, I was really disappointed that you only looked at IPv4. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we were looking at the internet. <laughs> um, Next try. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with your experience, you have a guess if you expect that the routes are different for IPv6 or probably kind of similar. Well, as we know, um, IPv6 routing is different than IPv4 routing. Um, and I think Jeff Houston said it best a decade ago is when there's enough money behind IPv6, the IPv6 routing will get straightened out. <clears throat> there's been a lot of interesting work on looking at the difference between the two. Um, you could clearly, trivially run this over V6 versus V4, and if you're looking for v V6 probes to use, this is trivial. Um, we didn't do it. That's um, um, a common failure. I um, um, realize when I give her a hard time about V6, those people that don't know me, is I'm, I'm at the first ISP to deploy IPv6 in the world, 1997. So <laughs> um, um, it's trivial to make it do V6. OK. So I have one question before I get out of here, which is, um, is there a DNS behavior researcher in the room? <laughs> <laughs> You're only fit to catch me at the break, would you? Because um, in the knock, we see something really cute. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can you set this on or something? Can I see that one? Yeah. Oh, that's Randy. Randy, can we follow this? No, that's the clicker. Oh, you want to use the clicker? Okay. <laughs> 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 I don't go backwards. <laughs> so, the next talk is not up yet. The next talk is given by uh, Petros Gigis. Um, he's also looking at ripe data, and he's using looking at user to user connectivity. Um, 
and now I forgot your whole CV, you're a PhD student, right? No, I'm a master's student. <laughs> master's student, okay. Um, and you're currently at, uh, at RIPE? I was there for an embassy. No, okay, no, you're no. already gone, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I just leave you to your presentation. Do you need help? I don't know if something's not. Yes. This one works. No, this is not working. This is not working. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll check from the laptop. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Petros Gigis, and today I will present uh, the paper characterizing user to user connectivity. Using you can't break that mic, it's not working. No, yeah. nobody's taking it. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll speak. Okay, now you can hear me, right? So I'll present the paper characterizing user-to-user -user connectivity using RIPE Atlas. This is a joint work with... Yeah, you're going to need that. Pretend the microphone doesn't work at all. Okay, okay. And stop holding it. Okay. <laughs> so this is a joint work with Vasily Skotroni, Stephen... Uh, ah, okay. Emil Aben, Stephen Sroven, and Fondas. And uh, for this work, we had to develop two different tools. The tools are already available as a prototypes. And uh, we use RIPE Atlas for the measurements. But first of all, let's look at... Uh, oh. Let's look on the probe deployment around the globe so we can see that there are RIPE Atlas probes almost everywhere, with Africa being an outlier. And these probes are deployed in hundreds of networks, but we don't have any kind of estimates, estimates of the users that are being covered using these probes. So in this work, we focus on eyeball networks. And uh, we, when we say eyeball networks, we refer to the networks that have the largest user population, that contains the largest user population in any given country. So uh, as an example, an ISP is an eyeball network. And uh, studying eyeball networks is very important and interesting because it's user-to-user uh, -user traffic and uh, it's important for real-time communication like online game, VoIP, and uh, <coughs> a, this depends on how these networks are interconnect each other. So there are many interesting properties that we can study. And in this work, we study the traffic locality. So we try to see if the traffic between two eyeball networks in a country stays inside the country and if the eyeball networks are direct, uh, are direct or indirect, either connected. And uh, this is important for three main reasons. The first one is for security reasons. So, we, if you have an eyeball network connected direct with another eyeball network, you minimize eyes dropping. You also maybe have less latency, and it's easier for a network administrator to debug. And uh, the main questions that we address in this work is to see if RIPE Atlas is deployed in the network with the largest user population in every country, and also study how these networks are interconnected each other. And uh, we had also to think which are the interesting properties we should study and me measure and visualize. But also we wanted to see if there are these properties differ from country to country and if there are patterns between countries. 
So we had to create two tools, as I said in the beginning. And uh, using these tools, we try to answer to this question to find the most suitable way to visualize the statistics and measurements. And for the first tool, we used the APNIC estimates. APNICs provide user population estimates per ASN, per any given country. So we selected the eyeball networks using two different thresholds. The first one, we assume that an eyeball network is a network that has at least 1% of the user's population in that country. And we also select one more threshold, the cumulative 95 percentage of population covered in that country. Later, we used the RIPE Atlas API to fetch probes for these networks. And we also convert our uh, estimates of uh, covered using statistics from Internet Live Stats. So if we have at least one RIPE Atlas probe active in an eyeball network, we assume that the network is covered. On average, we have 90.5% covered in any given county. However, there are some outliers like Russia. And uh, we wanted to make this more clear, so we visualize our findings. And here is a global hey, map hey, of, the of the RIPE Atlas covered. We look on IPv4 uh, probes, which are public. So we use a, a range of colors, with the white are the countries with no non, uh, eyeball covered, and uh, with dark green are the countries with uh, uh, 100 percent ripe atlas covered. So we can see that uh, Africa is again an outlier. But also we wanted to provide a more useful insight for network operators and ripe atlas ambassadors. So we create a more detailed view. Actually, the tool is already available on the link of the bottom. So it's sg bap net and Petro slash uh, population covered. So this is a table that we create on a daily basis using the methodology that I, descri I described before. So this is a snapshot of 12th of July, and we can see that for the largest eyeball network in Czech Republic, we fail to mark it as a covered because we have only one private probe. But having one private probe, it's not useful. We need public probes to measure this network. So if we deploy one probe in this network, we will increase the percentage coverage in the Czech Republic for all, from almost 50% to 80%. And, okay. and next, uh, we created one more tool. We call it Eyeball the Die. And uh, the main concept of the tool is to use active measurements. So we use RIPE Atlas probes from eyeball to eyeball, and we do trace routes from eyeball to eyeball networks. And uh, we look on the properties, like if a trace route pass stays inside the country, and if a trace route pass traverse other ASs, if yes, which ones, how many of them, and uh, let me give you some more uh, details about the implementation. So we do monthly trace route from eyeball to eyeball networks. And uh, for the probe selection right now, we use a very simply uh, methodology. We select the closest and the farthest probe from the country's capital uh, to try to expose the AS diversity and uh, we use RIPESTAT to map IPs to ASs. We support IPv4 and IPv6. And to 
geolocate the trace route pass, we use open IP map. In order to, as I said before, to uh, visualize the statistics and the findings, we had to come up with a visualization. So we created the AS to AS matrix. The AS to AS matrix is a stable structure. Each row represents an eyeball network as a source and each column represents an eyeball network as a destination. The size of the cells depends on the ethnic estimate, estimates, and uh, the color of the cells represents interesting properties, like if a trace route path goes out of country, stays in, in country, we have ripe atlas covered, are there any inconsistencies uh, between probes? I forgot to mention that we select two probes per eyeball network. So we have two against two other probes in the destination eyeball networks. So may, we may see different trace, path, uh, trace route paths. And we use a basic metric. So we select, uh, as an example, the green boxes, and we divide it with a whole area of AS to AS metrics to find the basic metric percentage. And next is an example of a eyeball Jedi for Canada. This is a snapshot of 1st of April. So we can see that uh, almost 47% uh, of the uh, trace route pass stays inside the country. And only 3.1% is going out of country. We have some inconsistencies and uh, we like to measure small networks. We also investigate the direct and indirect pass, and uh, we use the border to distinguish the, the direct and indirect paths. So with uh, white borders, it's uh, the direct eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball, uh, interconnection. So for Canada, we found out that almost 41% or a trace route paths between eyeball to eyeball networks, what we measure is direct paths. And next, as we are in Czech Republic, we couldn't resist and <laughs> measure Czech Republic. So as, as I said previously, we like to cover the biggest eyeball network. So that's why you see the uh, white boxes. And uh, we also see here that almost 10% of the uh, trace out paths between eyeball networks. They go out of country. We like to cover 32%. Uh, we do not measure uh, 46%. And the direct path are 17%. We also measure Australia. And this tool measures right now 104 countries. And it's available in the link on the bottom of the slide. And as we can see in Australia, between eyeball to eyeball interconnections, we see that every trace route path stays inside the continent. And indirect and direct paths are uh, 25% and 29% respectively. In this work, we have some limitations. So first of all, RIPE Atlas provides a biased a view of uh, in-country connectivity. We measure tra trace route pass and no traffic volume. We don't have ground truth about the IP level and geolocation accuracy. And we also face the same difficulties with, with other works like IP to AS mappings. And we plan in the future to use tools like MapIt to improve to improve that. We also measure on layer three. We don't have any layer two visibility. And uh, we are looking for ground roof inference for uh, our for our uh, for the ethnic estimates and also for the way that we uh, <coughs> define the in in out of country path. So as a future work, 
we plan to move from prototype of this tool to a fully fledged tools and make them publicly valuable to the community, to the network operators and also to the researchers. And uh, we, want, we want also to gain visibility on the eyeball to neighbor our neighbor country eyeball traffic. So as an example, we want to measure the eyeball networks of Netherlands against eyeball networks of Germany. And we also want to measure uh, eyeball to popular CDNs. We are also looking on more sophisticated probe grouping selections and uh, we look for collaboration and contribution on, on this. We need also to validate our inference about IP to AS mapping, uh, the geolocation, and as I said before, we want to integrate tools like MapIt on our methodology. So for conclusion, we estimate the right Atlas coverage in eyeball networks and we presented a prototype of the eyeball ZDI. The main aim of the tool is to measure and visualize aspects of user-to-user -user connectivity per country. And the tool is developed to help users and operators to discover interesting interconnectivity artifacts in the countries they live or they operate. The tool is available again on that link. And uh, our work is based to probe to probe measurements using RIPE Atlas. We use the APNIC estimates, and we are very thankful for APNIC that provides such kind of uh, statistics. And we use AP2S mapping from RIPE RIP stat, and uh, we do the geolocation <laughs> using open IP map. So you can view the, uh, the tools. They are, as I said, they are available. So if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I have two quick clarification questions. So one is, which kind of trace route did you use? Uh, we use Paris trace routes. So TCP trace route. Yes. OK. Um, and the other one is you have this inconsistency number. So that's when you do two measurements and they show different results. Yeah, OK. Very well. Sometimes that we see that a trace route, use a, a probe, use a different upstream provider to reach the same network. So it may depends on the on the network. As an example, Greece, because I know the ecosystem in Greece, for a network they divide their uh, network into parts, the north and the south. Mm -hmm. So they use two different upstream providers, even to reach another network. Okay. So that's why we see any consistencies. Yeah. Okay, do we have a... Uh, I'll, I'll try. Does, does, does this work? Yes. Okay, so if, if you bite into it, then it works. Um, I had a question. You had, for, for, for your definition of an eyeball network, you had this magic number of 1% of the, of, of the users of a country. Where, where does this number come from? Is this... It, it, intuitively, it feels too small to be representative. Actually, we want to study in a fine granularity, and we want to make a visualization that easy that it's easy for uh, Samyon to to view it. So, if we lower the threshold, we will end up to something like the IXP country today. We'll have hundreds of networks. So, so in other words, one percent is already a pretty large number. It's a, it's a large number. No, I was no. So, so I would have said if a, a, a network is representative for a country if it covers ten percent of the users or fifteen percent, not just one percent. This is what I'm wondering about. So that actually goes in line with my previous question because if you saw these inconsistencies because some of the network providers split up the network then you just randomly saw it some, at some point, and in other points you might not have selected any nodes that would have shown the same behavior. So maybe you need to measure more probes within a network to yes. get a better view. Yes. That's also kind of what you're saying, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah.
Okay. Um, so I have, uh, I guess, a little bit of a meta question. I'm wondering why you started by focusing on uh, end user to end user traffic patterns. Now, I, you know, I work for a CDN, so maybe I have a distorted view of the world, but it seems to me that most people's interactions with the internet involve a third party, a service provider of some sort, whether it's email or their collect or a website or something. So, why is user to user uh, direct connectivity interesting? Actually, there are many applications that we use user to user uh, connectivity. Can and, you give uh, me a couple of examples? Like. Uh, VoIP? VoIP? <laughs> direct end to end VoIP? Yeah. Is that. Are you. That's a. Sorry, now I'm arguing with Magnus, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and. So, yes, you have a destroyed view of the world. Yes, yes. Well, all right. So, I, right, so I, I tried to preface my remarks, but it just seems to me that there's a, that, why start there? I guess that's the question. I'm and not saying that there isn't that traffic, but what makes that interesting? And uh, this is a first step. So, we plan to measure against CDNs, but measuring uh, towards C CDNs is uh, a lot of more complex. Um, this is actually, oh wow, okay, hello. Um, this is actually more of a, a comment than a question. Because um, you, you, you pointed out that you're looking, like future work is integrating border map and or map it. Um, I'm wondering how much of your inconsistency actually comes from inaccurate um, AS boundary inference. Because AS boundary inference is a, is a well, I mean, like if you look at the, at the, the prior work and map it, right? Um, AS boundary image is a really hard problem, and doing the dumb thing ends up having, um, you, you get like wildly inaccurate estimates for certain topologies. So when you see an inconsistency, some of that could be either um, zoned routing or different routing policies where, you know, you're, as, as Randy pointed out, you're making the, um, the common, um, uh, it's a common fallacy of an AS is actually an, uh, an internally coherent thing. Um, but I think that some of it could be your, your border inference. Or am I missing where that incoherency is coming, or that where that inconsistency is coming from? It may be, be the, the border, as you said, but also it can be wrong geolocation. So ah, okay, yep, right. Which is also for ripe atlas probes is is um, best effort faith, right? So yes. okay, cool, thanks. And uh, I'm. Having kind of the same last question again, did you look into IPv6? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we looked. <laughs> but currently we have on the online tool only IPv4, but soon we, IPv6 will be there. And we plan to make it like a fully fledged tool. Okay, thank you very much. Are you bringing your own laptop? Uh, yes. Okay. Perfect. So while Anna is setting up, this is really fun. Can you hear me? No, no. Because it's off. <laughs> okay, now. No. No, 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 no. It, it turns off again. Okay, um, so the next talk or the next paper is uh, a full paper and it's from EMESH and he can un unfortunately not be here. I guess that's the one travel grant that didn't work out maybe. Jörg? That's a student, who, okay. Um, so, um, no, okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> that's it, some, okay. <laughs> um, so he couldn't come, uh, he's at Cisco Rice in Sweden, um, and now Anna Brunström is presenting instead. She's a professor um, at uh, Karlstedt University. Um, and you've been kind of working with them together and doing some measurements, right? You're basically involved in this. Well, I, can. <laughs> I can answer that question, I guess. So yes, so Ian could unfortunately not be here. He's in Australia for family reasons. So he sent his apologies. And uh, I will try to introduce his work on SheSpy which is a lightweight uh, measurement platform, which so uses Raspberry Pis as the measurement nodes. 
So this is a, a platform that Ian has been working on for the last three years or so. And this uh, paper, SheSpy Research Results and the Regulator, kind of gives some uh, uh, background on this work and summarizes a bit the, the different measurements that have been done and uh, what it's uh, looking forward to do. So if you've uh, looked at the paper, you've seen that it covers a, a number of different aspects. And uh, this work has been done in the context of uh, REDI, which is a national uh, project in Sweden, with the research environment for advancing low latency internet. And Costa University is a partner in that project. So in that sense, I have heard about uh, sheets by a number of times. We have uh, one of the nodes located in Kolstad, but I have not uh, been directly involved in this work uh, or in the measurements in the paper. So. Um, this is all I, Ian's uh, work, so I will do my best to try and, and still introduce it. And also one interesting thing to mention is maybe that this was first presented at the RAIN workshop two years ago, also co-located with uh, the IETF, um, and now we're happy to actually see some results here. Yes, so if you were at RAIN, then Ian introduced the, the platform there and talked a little bit uh, about it. So. Uh, Uh, Ian has sent me uh, the slides and uh, it has three parts. So first some general uh, aspects about uh, the measurement background for the platform and the context in which it has been uh, developed. Then some uh, examples of uh, the measurements that have been uh, done up to now and the types of measurements that you can use the platform for. And then some uh, future uh, directions. Uh, so, uh, SheSpy targets home networks, so the idea is to try and capture the, the um, internet performance as you see as a home user, so you would put one of these uh, SheSpy devices in the home and measure uh, performance from there, so the greater context is kind of that you see uh, internet at home as a utility and then of course we need to have an ability to monitor and follow up on this. Uh, measuring from the home uh, vantage point is also something that is uh, typically not so easy from uh, the external tools that the ISPs may use to, to monitor the network, so it's in that sense uh, complementary to that type of uh, measurements. Uh, so uh, there are of course a lot of different uh, measurement platforms and measurement work out there. So as I said, uh, SheSpy uh, targets measurement from the home network, so in that sense it's has similar goals as other tools that have also looked at home networking, such as Phantom, Netlizer, HostView. Uh, already from the beginning, uh, Ian has been in context with the, the regulators in Sweden, Post and TLS and the PTS. So it's also an intention here that the monitoring should be uh, useful from a regulatory perspective. And uh, I, Ian is working together with PTS to try and uh, uh, develop the platform in that way. Uh, the need for uh, using our res the measurement that we do as researchers as a measurement community also for regulations and influencing policy was something that was uh, discussed also at Ames workshop uh, earlier this year. And of course the different regulators are also doing uh, efforts in this area. So in Europe we have uh, uh, Beric, the, the board for the European regulators that have looked at how you um, can follow up on the directives for, for open internet that we have in Europe. Uh, in the US you have FCC which has the um, Broadband America measurement campaigns to try and follow up on, on internet performance. Uh, so this, this work uh, with PTS kind of ties into these, these aspects. And uh, the regulatory view is also something that has been uh, discussed in IETF in the IPPM uh, measurement group. I think there was a draft discussed in Chicago that related to this from the um, net neutrality and regulators uh, perspective. So uh, SheSpy, will it solve all these problems? Of course not. It's just uh, you know, one attempt here, another measurement platform to make some contribution in this space. And uh, the way the platform is uh, set up is that you uh, write your, your tasks, your measurements are typically this, uh, put together in Python and then the platform has a uh, mechanism so that the results get collected in the database on the Pi nodes, uh, synchronized to a central database. 
uh, which collects all the measurements. There is a scheduling system so that you can indicate the schedule for when your test should be run. And there is also a, a dashboard for the tests that are available with GSPI. So there are like 15 uh, measurement tasks defined so that you can, as a user, see the, the impact of your, uh, the quality of your connection and the results of the measurements. So there is a, a further slide on this later on here. Uh, and of course now, Ian is looking into also how to design the specific tests that the regulators would be uh, looking at here. And of course, then we are talking about things like, are you doing tra traffic differentiation in the networks or the flow prioritizations? Do we treat different applications in different ways and so on? So the things are things that you would need to follow up on, on the regulatory, uh, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, when you do measurements, you can have different approaches. You may do the crowdsourced approach where you have a lot of um, volunteers that download your software and you get a lot of measurements. And from that, you derive um, your statistics and your, your view of the network. So this is not the goal of GSPI. So the idea here is rather to try and very carefully select your measurement points so that with a minimum of nodes, you can collect the information that you would need to kind of get the view of the network and follow up from the, the regulatory perspectives. And having a long lasting measurements, and there's also been, Ian has also focused quite a bit on uh, specific events, on busy times when you have some popular things that the, the regular user would like to take part in or to view and see how the network works under those con conditions. And of course, if we're now going to put this platform in the home users and run it from there, it's uh, essential that it's uh, trivial to install and configure. Uh, so from the regulatory perspective, you need to uh, follow up on different directives, which are often quite vague, maybe in the way they are specified. So you need to be able to define how to actually uh, do the follow up on this and to then also have some method to see that the ISPs or other actors, if they are not following this. So in Sweden, at the moment, what PTS does is basically it uses surveys. So it sends out surveys to a number of, of users to see how the, the quality of the network connections are. It also sends out surveys to uh, the operators to have them report on if they do what type of traffic differentiation they may use and what special services they have. So the idea here is to, the goal here together with PTS is to also support this with measurement information where you can actually detect some of uh, these things and see if, if what you get into in your surveys is also what the users actually see in the network. Uh, so if you're now going to measure from a perspective of, of a regulator and use this maybe to enforce policy, then the fairness of the measurements is one key issue that um, Ian is currently thinking about and that I think will also need more thought here. It's not that there are some, a lot of this is still a work in progress, even though it's been ongoing for a while. So. Uh, when we as researchers do measurements, we are a bit opportunistic and we look for some particular aspect and we, we may measure and if we catch that, this is uh, maybe serving our purpose. But if you're gonna use it more from the regulatory perspective, you have to be fair to all the different operators and see that you uh, capture a, a correct view. So how do you do fair measurements? This I think is an open issue. Do you need to measure uh, the same number of, of traffic per operator? Do you scale it depending on the size of the operators? Do you need to have the exact same, same time when you do the measurements and so on? And what will be accepted by the uh, different actors in the, uh, that are involved in this issue? So this is also something that in Sweden, there are ongoing discussions right now between the different uh, actors involved in this space on how to define uh, measurements that all can agree on actually or representative and uh, can be used to measure internet quality. Okay, so this was a bit of, of the background and the general scope that GSPI has been uh, uh, developed in. So now some uh, examples of the type of measurements that EN has done in the past. So the platform has so far, of course, also been used uh, mainly for the research purpose so far. So there are three types of 
measurements that you could do in the platform. The first, of course, is that you can take your, your SysPy node and then you can measure to some service at the internet. And what Ian has mainly been looking at in that context is to uh, video delivery. And in particular, he's trying to uh, look at stalling events. Uh, we all know that video download is a complex uh, aspect, so you have a lot of interactions between different aspects between the different algorithms involved, between the networking effects. So he's been doing uh, capturing measurements here to try and uh, identify which one of these things that you can measure in the network actually has an impact on the stalling of the video and applying various statistical techniques to try and isolate the different components. And for this work, he's using some of the video uh, sequences from the video quality expert group, which has a, a pre-rating uh, offline so that you have a baseline for what the, the video should, type of rating the video should get if there are no impairments over, over the network. Uh, another type of measurements that Ian has been doing is between different uh, SheSpy nodes. So then you have control of both uh, the server and the, the client in the measurements. And he has been doing, for instance, basic delay measurements. So for that, he uses uh, uh, TCP-based measurements, so measuring either in the handshake or the teardown of the connection. So you can measure between the SYN and the SYNAC. And this, of course, gives you a, a delay measurement for the network. And as you have control, you can also remove the, the delays from the server processing or the client processing. So this is an example graph from the paper illustrating some of the measurements from the platform. So the blue here is uh, basic ping measurements. And then there's the delay measurements that are based rather on the, on the TCP measurements. And you have uh, the green one when you have not removed the, the server processing delay and the red one when the ser server processing delay is, uh, is removed. And if he's trying to do this, of course, uh, also not just once, but over time to capture the stability of the network. And one of the future directions that he's also looking into is using this in, for multipath and also doing multipath uh, measurements over SheSpy, where you could then use this as, as input for, for path selection if you have his historic data here. Uh, then the, the third type of measurement that Ian has been doing is using multiple SheSpies to monitor some uh, uh, events, some key happenings. Uh, uh, in this case, he has looked at the boxing matches that are very popular. So a lot of users go online at the same time and then measuring over time so that you can see here is an example for one of the boxing games that they monitor. So here is the time up to the match. You can see that the delay in the network is uh, quite stable. And then what, the closer you get to the event, then you actually see that uh, you have some impairments for some of the, the providers of this game. And uh, by trying to measure from multiple uh, cheese pie measurement points and also with multiple measurements, he's trying to separate the different aspects that contributes to the delay here. So we have uh, both the basic uh, ping measurements and then also the measurements at the HTTP level. So to try and separate the effects that comes from the server being overloaded from the effects that come from the network being overloaded. And this in general, of course, is not so, so easy. I mean, you, you see the end effect, but to also try and isolate what is actually the cause of, of the difference. So he's trying to then look at the combination of these me uh, different measurements to isolate the different uh, effects. Uh, as I mentioned, there is also a, a user interface available uh, for this uh, SheSpy platform, and it has some different uh, levels. So there is a interface for the more tech-savvy users. So it, I think it's very hard for you to see now. You have this uh, figure also in the paper. But this one illustrates some of the outcomes of some of the, the tests that are defined in the uh, platforms. There is like a speed test-like test. There is a HTTP download of one of the Alexa sites. There is some uh, DNS uh, lookup test, I think. And you also have some statistics on the SheSpy uh, platform itself and, and the load on, on the measurement nodes. So you can get some quite detailed statistics on the tests that are being run. Uh, as this is intended to run in uh, the home network and also be for the average user, Ian has also worked on trying to 
have a more simple interface for the non-techie <laughs> non user. So this is an attempt to illustrate how well your network is working. So this is kind of your, your speed of data coming in. And in order to meet different uh, types of applications, you would need different uh, levels of water to be sustained here. And if it's met, then you have a happy duck in your uh, bathtub. So I'm not sure if this uh, <laughs> is easily interpreted by the by the end user, but this is one of the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> finally we write. <laughs> so, but this is one of the one of the aspects that Ian is also working on in connection to the visualization, and uh, he has also done uh, surveys to the end users to see how they. Uh, perceive various networks events and how they use their their uh, internet services so trying to combine the measurements with the more traditional way of, of gathering information from the users okay so that was an, an overview of the three types of measurements and some of the examples from the papers paper on the the different measurements that have been done uh, looking uh, forward he uh, is working with the regulators to roll out uh, uh, additional pies. So as I said, the target here is not to have a huge uh, scale employment, but to deploy enough nodes to get some uh, representative measurements. I think at the moment the target is around 200 uh, measurement points. And uh, to also then design these tests together with the regulators that can help uh, enlighten on the net neutrality part. As I said, he's w working on the video stall uh, quantification and trying to detect what metrics uh, influence this and how you could actually make some predictions from your network measurements if you have uh, video stalls at the user uh, level. He also wants to use the multiple vantage points from the different pies to look at that shared infrastructure and congestion in the network. And as I mentioned, he's also um, uh, initiating multipath experiments from the SheSpice using the MPTCP uh, implementation and they are also connecting it to some of the more basic uh, measurements that the platform already provides and that can give you some uh, input for how to tune these these protocols. Thank you very much. And Jörg again has the first question. <laughs> <laughs> First, uh, I think uh, this has got to be the most awesome project name that I've ever heard. When you said two cheese pies, the first thing I thought, you can do that? You can have two? Um, <laughs> uh, second, uh, I did want to ask on a little more serious note, and maybe you mentioned this, um, but um, are, you, uh, are you putting these nodes uh, on mobile networks at the far end of wireless links, uh, on uh, platforms that have uh, multiple access technologies, things that are more representative of the kinds of systems that we're seeing more of today? Uh, so, so far, I think he has not had any of them deployed on the mobile network. So I think uh, at the moment it's on a fixed network or Wi-Fi. Uh, but I think he's looking into also having uh, additional access technologies. Randy Bush, Randy Bush, IJ. Um, this is cool and worthwhile. We see this being done in a number of countries. The customer is the regulator. So you never cross the border. We're on the global internet. So you have a special tool here. We have one too, IIJ. I mean, it's fun because we host the biggest event in Japan is the summer high school baseball playoffs. 300 terabits on our network. Okay, so we measure it, I assure you with a unique platform. Mm -hmm. One of the wonderful things about Atlas is it covers the internet. Would you people measuring for your regulators please conspire <laughs> and have a uniform platform? Uh, Matt Ford. Um, just wondered about the, the rebuffering measurements that you talked about. I wondered if, as I know that Google has, um, you know, measurements for you know 
on YouTube rebuffering events by AAS. I don't think they share them publicly, but um, I wondered if you'd considered um, collaborating with them to verify the kind of measurement results that you're getting, or not not necessarily you know YouTube, but other other uh, service providers as a, you know, a way of um, at least informally kind of validating the results that you're getting. Um. I think that Ian would be very happy to do that. I don't think he has done so, but I think it's a very good uh, idea, of course, to, to try and do that. And I mean, in general, to correlate the measurement results from, from different sources um, is, of course, very important. Yes, uh, I work for one of the ISPs in Sweden. So you are you're treating, seeing that, that stalling is an indication of unfair treatment of the traffic. Is that what the paper says? You mm -hmm. said there's the stalling in YouTube. That is an indicator of some differentiation in the network. No, no, I don't think that's what the paper says uh, yeah. or what the intention is. So th these uh, were actually some different measurements that have been done. So he's used the platform to look at you know various aspects. So the, the work on the buffer stalling is not directly related to the net neutrality tests. Okay, uh, and as far as I understand it, I mean, I, I have to. <laughs> but, but another test was uh, for him to confirm yeah. this, of course, because the the, the timing for the TCP handshake. Uh, I know a little bit of global classification of traffic for other purposes, and I, that is not a, if that was the indicator, a timing, some differentiation there, you will, you, you that will then be implicit that there are some pipe triple that is the, the, the trigger for the differentiated uh, treatment of the traffic. So I don't understand what uh, uh, that is, uh, how that can be an indicator of any differentiated treatment, the timing in the TCP. Uh, so Patrick. so maybe this was, was unclear in the presentation. I think that the three examples that he has in the paper for, for the type of measurements that you can do in the network are not directly related to uh, the, the design of the net neutrality tests that will be used for, for measuring that aspect. So this is, I think those tests is something that he is currently developing together with, uh, discussing with PTS. Okay, thanks. Hi, Jörg, I have, I had one, a bit follow up on on uh, Randy's point. Um, so if you look at the if you look at Atlas and Ripe and Cheese Pie and probably half a dozen others, there's there's I think there's Mummy and Monroe probes and and, and so so was there any conscious um, market placement decision behind um, the development of this? Is there a specific area that, that that Ian had in mind when building this thing that the others wouldn't cover? Because most of them are also geared towards home network, uh, watching from the home network perspective, different complexity and measurements, of course. I'm just curious. Um, I, I think that when he started, from the very start, he did not have that set perspective. Now I'm you know, guess, guessing a bit yeah, here because yeah. <laughs> it's not my work. But it started almost like a hobby project in some sense, okay. getting the, the Raspberry Pis, doing the measurements. Then very early on, he uh, got in contact with, with PTS, All right. and they had then an interest uh, in getting some form of measurements in Sweden. So that's when the collaboration started. I think that when he started, he did not have that perspective, but it came in very early in the process because uh, PTS was very interested in the type of, of platform that he was developing okay. and he already from the beginning targeted the home use case so I mean that that I think was the intention to measure what what type of quality you see as a home user and it started with looking at the, this video and media events and, and seeing what type of, of service you got for those. Mm -hmm. Those were the first measurements he did as far as I, I know. Okay, cool. The other question I had... Uh, that Can I add something yeah. to that point? Because all the measurement platforms you mentioned uh, you see usually very restricted in the amount of data you can send on the on this platform just the way they are designed, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't allow you for, like for example, high-speed tests and stuff. So I think this is probably more comparable to Semnos. Um, and it's really also a different set of tests you run on these platforms and you also have a different agreement with the users who deploy those platforms because they know that's a regulated test. So it, it, there is a little bit of a difference, but I think there still is uh, a need to 
it would be nice to kind of map this out and figure yeah, out yeah. so what do you what do you use for which as an external user who might be interested in yeah. and, and also which what which platforms are good for what that's, that's, that's also a good question can you as an external user run any measurements on this platform probably not right you can probably talk to ian and ask him if he can run something for you that's close enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think right now there is not like an open external interface so you can run it you, you you can design, the, the tests are fairly easy to design as far as I understand it. I know he's also used it together with students and they have designed, you know, tests and, and they have uh, run it on the platform. But there, as far as I know, there's no like external interface to access it and run it. So, so since Jörg said we could map out the tools, we have a research group that's called the MAP Research Group that's measurement. Um, and maybe that would be an interesting thing to uh, put together mm -hmm. as kind of a uh, directory of mm -hmm. the available and how they differ and how they're the same. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, which is also mentioned as related work in this paper, there is a survey on uh, measurement platforms, but we could definitely mm -hmm. look further into that. And I guess you have started to collect some of that, info, or at some point it was discussed at least to try and do that in, in MapRG, right? So in MapRG so far, we, um, we gave people a platform to announce their measurement platform, but we didn't do any effort in trying to compare them or mm -hmm. kind of figuring out what the different abilities are the platforms provide. The other small question I had about it was about MPTCP. Since you mentioned that there's no cellular right now planned, I'm wondering how you do multipath TCP from a home network user if your wife if your Ethernet and your Wi-Fi connect to the same DSL line or whatever. Is there anything? You have two IP addresses. IPv6. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I mean, answering to this, York, you just use different port names and you exploit multiple paths up on the network. Right, but you're but you're categorizing paths farther away. So, given this is given this is an uh, IRTF workshop and we're already talking about multipass TCP, I would also like to announce that there is a new proposed workshop group, uh, workshop group, <laughs> research group on uh, path aware networking, which looks into path selection, these kind of things, where the first meeting is held on Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. So if you stay here for the week, that might be interesting. Uh, also come to MapRG. The meeting is Thursday morning on measurements. Um, and I would like to get to one more point we actually have like 10 more minutes so we can chat about that um so the thing i liked about this paper is there is one sentence in the introduction saying small data can be of value too <laughs> <laughs> um and i think that was a little bit the, the scheme uh, um of all three presentations that were they were trying to minimize the, the amount of measurement data mm -hmm. they were taking um so i think that's a good thing i think that's the right thing to do instead of just co collecting huge amounts of data and then you don't know what to do with it. But I don't really understand that much this fairness question because I think that's somehow related. You try to minimize your data so much that you cannot guarantee that it's um, statistically significant anymore. <laughs> and so then you have the fairness, fairness issue. But if you just make sure you have enough data that it's significant, there shouldn't be a fairness question anymore because you actually measure what you want to measure. No? I guess it depends on what you try to measure. Um, it has to be statistically significant for each operator, I guess, in order to, to be fair. For some of the measurements we do as, as researchers, we may not look for that distinction that, you know, we actually want to s say something that is generally relevant on, on an operator level. We may look for other, other phenomena. So, I think it's it that aspect I think was is related to the particular aspect of what you need to actually say something about the operators and um, capturing their behavior rather than capturing uh, protocol behaviors or, or things that appear in the network. But I mean, in principle, I, I agree, and I am not <laughs> uh, that if you have. Uh, sufficient amount of data to have statistically significant results that that should take care of that uh, Spencer Dawkins it's it seemed like to me that one one of the things I was getting out of this was that regulators could use this not to say that there is no problem but to say here's something that we should look at further 
you know, so that use doing small amounts of, of uh, doing tests with small amounts of data and things like that was valuable to say, you know, to attract their attention on something where the alternative right now is just paper surveys. So, you know, so I, I thought there was that aspect to it as well. You know, like that's not saying that, you know, it's not saying you've taken your last measurement, but it's saying that you could have used the ones that you've already taken. Yes, I, I think certainly it's not intended that you just measure and you have all the answers. I mean, you combine it with techniques and you may need to look further into aspects if you find something, of course. Randy Bush, IJ, on a totally different research project. The paper said in the introduction and in the abstract that it exploited existing trace route measurements and made no new measurements. Two thirds of the reviewers said, you created a lot of unnecessary measurements. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably also a good comment. Maybe figure out which measurement data are there already before you try to do new measurements. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think with this, we just close the measurement session here. Thank you very much, Anna. <laughs> and then we have coffee outside and see you back in 11.15.